thousands of vices. Did Liszt have any vices, really? Uh, I mean, yes. women, of course, and having... Uh, that's that's uh, a question that um, could be open to discussion. Whether it was a vice? Yeah. <laughs> what about smoking and so on? Was he a fancier of fine cigars? Yes, he loved cigars. Uh, not fine, but the cheapest possible cigars, really. <laughs> this the is strongest, the yes. Also, his princess loved cigars, and it was reputed to, that she had them actually dipped in iron filings to make the tobacco even stronger. He was very addicted to coffee, wine, oysters for breakfast, uh, very cheap, bad cigars, and uh, being at times a charlatan, desiring constant adulation, mm -hmm. doing magnanimous gestures that are astounding, uh, writing uh, thousands of letters a year. Uh, did he teaching, have, did he conducting, have, and you must and, uh, uh, remember that Liszt is the first great conductor of the 19th century. Almost all conducting, especially the romantic school of conducting, um, follows what he did in that realm. Remember at Weimar he had an orchestra, and he uh, carried over his concept of flexible phrasing into conducting, and it was a great influence on Wagner, who became a very great conductor. I have a couple of questions. He was obviously, uh, in spite of his cheap cigar habit, he was a very wealthy man. Did he have secretaries? Did he write his own music? Did he have people transcribe it for him? He used some of his students as secretaries. Uh, Arthur Friedheim, great pianist and Liszt uh, player, uh, was his secretary. Uh, he had a real bunch of talented people around him doing many errands. Uh, before he was totally competent in orchestration, he worked with uh, Joachim Raff and other of uh, the people surrounding him. So he, he made use of his environment, and of course many of these people were around for his uh, ego, mm -hmm. as well as uh, they wanting to be in the uh, tremendous circle of glamour that Liszt created. Uh, the Grand Duke of Weimar remarked, Liszt is what a prince ought to be. He had definitely an aura. Sitwell said that uh, some men have the evil eye, Liszt had the glamorous eye. And the aura of his playing, the aura of the old man, the young man, all of it was a, a spectacular life which spanned the whole romantic epic. Now, uh, the author Peter Yates writes, and this is important because what we're certainly trying to do, although feebly, is attempt to show Liszt's vast range. Nothing to equal the range of thought and styles in any other 19th century composer. Witness Chopin, Matt, consistent. Schumann, fairly consistent stylistically. Uh, you can tell a late Schumann piece. Brahms, very consistent. Mm -hmm. Wagner, very consistent. All very different styles, but consistent. To hear the 16th Hungarian Rhapsody, as we will shortly, to the second Hungarian Rhapsody is quite a different concept harmonically the way he treated uh, music the uh, second rhapsody would be splashy the late works not at all he's really just writing now because he's convinced that he has a future but it's not in his lifetime and as he once said who now will help list not one of the tremendous army of students who loved the man and the piano playing they couldn't understand the music and usually did more harm by playing his cheaper pieces. Uh -huh. Anyway, we are attempting to uh, to show the great framework of this amazing man, and he, uh, Yeats writes this personality, amazing personality, whose life spans the 19th century from Beethoven to Debussy, has been made the scapegoat of the second rate. 
yet his art forms the continental divide between the high period of modern music and the 20th century. What is called romantic in music may be highly emotionalized composition from Froberger through C.P.E. Bach to Chopin and Schumann, or it may be literary, as in Schubert's Wanderer Fantasy, or Berlioz Tome Poem, or operatic, as in the bel canto movements of Clementi and Field, or brilliant on the surface, like many well-ordered compositions by Weber and Hummel, or prevailingly lyrical, like Fields and Chopin's Nocturnes, or essentially song-like melody and accompaniment, however elaborated. Liszt combined in his unequal and unlike compositions all these romantic forms, styles, mannerisms, gestures, and appearances, while preserving a thorough knowledge of classical organization when he wished to apply it. Liszt, by teaching the pianist to imitate an orchestra, he translated the tone poem into pianistic terms. He romanticized imitations of Hungarian folk music and the sound of the hammer-beaten cembalum. Though less genuine than Chopin's compositions in Polish folk style, Liszt stirred up an unprecedented musical nationalism. Smetana and Dvorak wrote in the language of Bohemia. Mazorsky conceived a native Russian music. Charles Ives later drew together with Ameri the American commonplace of hymns, ragtime, popular melody, and patriotic tune. In every country, some composer of better or worse quality found a voice in the speech of his environment, if only by such indirect reference as the nature sketches of Grieg and Edward McDowell. Other composers, by nationalistic analogy, put on a folk habit not their own. Brahms composing Hungarian dances, Dvorak a New World Symphony with American Negro tunes, and Ferruccio Buzzoni an Indian fantasy for piano and orchestra and American Indian themes. Uh, yes, it was Liszt that, that uh, began this flood of ethnic nationalism, which remains in the small countries uh, to this day, Kachaturian and Armenia and so forth. Um, Buzzoni once remarked that we are all and whatever we can do, from Balakarev to Richard Strauss, W.C., we are all branches from his tree. Buzzoni said Beethoven, uh, Bach was the foundation of piano playing, Beethoven the summit, and the two make Liszt possible. He was the greatest student Liszt ever had, although Buzzoni did not study with him. Now let's get to the music. It's the 16th Hungarian Rhapsody and the performer Michel Campanella.
my favorite of the late Rhapsodies. These were published after Liszt's death, and for at least 50 years, people thought Liszt composed 15 Rhapsodies. There are 19, and there's still one in manuscript. That's my favorite, and the performance was by Michel Campanella. Notice all of the tinsel is replaced, and you have almost a bare sound. Let's move to the 17th Rhapsody, which is really quite nothing more than a sketch. The performance, Roberto Sidon. Seventeenth Hungarian Rhapsody, and it's a, it's it comes from the pit of the stomach. It's a tragic wail. This is, as one can hear, nothing at all like the early rhapsodies with their three sections and their virtuosity and calculation. This is a heartfelt work. Liszt became more and more Hungarian as he grew older. He spent part of his year there teaching at the. Academy, which was really built for him. And, of course, Liszt had a certain amount of guilt pertaining to the Hungarian Revolution, where many of his friends were slaughtered, and he seemed uh, not to participate, although he wrote the funerai, and uh, this, is, this is a tragic wail, this work. And let's hear another performance, this time by Alfred Brendel.
the 17th Hungarian Rhapsody, Alfred Brendel, the pianist, and Brendel writes on his very good liner notes. Liszt's late compositions were considered the senile products of an old man, insofar as they were known at all. The sonorities become bleak and dwindle until only that which is indispensable remains. That's another very uh, uh, characteristic thing of what would happen in the uh, 20th century. Tonality is undermined. The harmonic consequences of the gypsy scale are drawn. Often only the skeleton, not, not to say the ghost, of a piece is left. Ostinato figures heighten the torment of the monotony. Understanding for these death sighs and dance macabres has been found only in our time, a time which has become accustomed to seeing the macabre with open eyes. And as we get into more of the late works, we'll hear this almost gruesome quality that would lead us into the 20th century. Now the Rhapsody 18. City number 18. 
and the performance, Matt, that was Michel Campanella? It was indeed, yeah. All right. Are you ready with number 19? I'm just about, if you're ready. I am. Thank you. 
Roberto Zidon in The Longest and Last of Liszt's Published Hungarian Rhapsodies. Alfred Brendel writes, These are the pieces to which we have need to make restitution. One must defend them on two fronts. Firstly, against musicians of the serious breed who look down on the rhapsodies as showpieces. And secondly, against the piano maniacs who abuse them as showpieces. One must also contend against recollections of salon orchestras and bar pianists who have utterly murdered these pieces. Where is the masterpiece that is able to survive a bar pianist? <laughs> Nothing is more false than the doctrine that great music cannot be ruined in performance. That was Sir Donald Francis Tovey. It is above all the rhapsodies that come to life through the improvisatory spirit and fire of the interpreter. They are wax in his hand like few other pieces in existence. Well, that concludes the 19 rhapsodies. And we'll be back shortly for other Listian excursions into the field of the Shardash. Two more pieces of Liszt remain on today's program, the Shardash Obstine and the Shardash Macabre, two amazing works of his old age. John Ogden writes, his music shows an avant-garde attitude to the problems of composing, which was without parallel in the 19th century. But what I think I admire most about the aged list is his continuing humility in the face of so splendid an achievement. He lived out his extraordinary life as if guided by the words that William Golding was to write 80 years later. There's a kinship among men who have sat by a dying fire and measured the worth of their life by it. We have a performance by Brendel in an amazing work, the Shardash Abstine, which reminds me again of Brendel's sentence, understanding for these death sighs and dance macabres have, has been found only in our time, a time which has become accustomed to seeing the macabre with open eyes. This is still, of course, the music of a 19th century composer, but already there's, there's something spooky about these two works. Let's hear the Shardash Abstinet.
splendid performance of the Chardash Obstiné by Alfred Brendel, a work of Liszt's last years. Now we have a work more remarkable, harsh, open sounds. Bartok valued it. Of course he did. The Chardash uh, uh, Macabre.
Work that has a mysterious power, at least over me. Liszt's work of his 73rd year, sitting in his abbe's Cossack in Rome, a public institution, yet no one wanted to hear his music. He now composed only for himself, and that was one of the late works, the Shardash Makab, Alfred Brendel, the pianist. And we'll continue with Liszt's music on our next program. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>